Good morning. I'm so glad when they said unto me, let us go unto the house of the Lord. Welcome to Kingston West this morning. But uh, before we get into our service, uh, there's some important announcement that uh, we need to, uh, we need to uh, listen to. Uh, Kingston West Men's Fellowship Discussion Group, Tuesday, March 23rd at 7 p.m. At the topic of the book of Job, Out of the Whirlwind, with Derek Thomas. See Pastor Keith with this uh, for more information about this uh, fellowship. Uh, Bible study with Pastor Deborah Hagabom. Sermon on, Sermon on the Mount takes place on Wednesday evening on Zoom at 7 p.m. And there's some uh, ID, uh, meeting ID and passcode on this one on Zoom. So refer to your bulletin. We had a good time on this one last uh, Wednesday, uh, last night, actually. Uh, and th there were uh, nine of us that had participated in this one. So it was nice. We had a good discussion, and we were blessed. The topic on that one is about the blessed. So we were blessed last night with the word of God. Uh, Thursday, uh, Thursday's uh, prayer meeting at 1.30 p.m. This goes on. It's also on Zoom, and uh, there are some uh, information on that on your bulletin. Or call uh, Pastor, uh, Pastor Stephen uh, for more information about this one. That's all the announcement that we have this morning. Our call to worship this morning is found in uh, Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Then, I will be, then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and, I will sing and make music to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this beautiful morning. And uh, Lord, we just pray now that uh, you be with us and uh, Lord, uh, bless us as we go into the service this morning. We pray that uh, all the things that being said and done will bring honor and glory to you. I pray also for our pastor as you use him again. Give him wisdom, O oh God, to bring about your message to your people. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, in the fourth chapter and the verses 14 to 16. It's entitled, Jesus the Great High Priest. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Now let us pray. Father in heaven, we bow our heads today, praising you with thankful hearts for how you care for your people. Father, we don't have to look far, but what we realize, you do so many things for us. You answer our prayers. You hear our hearts cry. You provide for us in so many ways. And today we are thankful. We praise you and thank you for being our God. And today, because of Jesus, we can pray with confidence. For he has won over this world. He has trampled, conquered sin and death on our behalf. And today we are grateful. We realize today there are so many that are even close by, Father, that are seeking you for special needs. And today, Father, we raise our voice with them, asking that your Holy Spirit would intervene. We seek not our will, Father, but your will in each case. For, Father, you already are aware. And you said if you have need, just to come and talk to me about it. So, Father, today we are. Meet these needs, we pray, Father, not for the glory of man, but for the glory of yourself. Father, as we hear from the word today, may we open our minds and hearts to what the Spirit wants to say. Father, may we allow it to change us, to affect our lives in a way that is honoring to you. May we drink in from the Spirit today so that we might better be suited to follow you in the days and weeks ahead. Thank you, Father, as a result of our obedience, what you will be able to do in this world. Thank you that you are always available to us. So now, Father, we commit this into your care and keeping, praising you and thanking you for all you do. And we ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our gospel reading this morning is found in the book of Luke, chapter 19, verses 28 to 48. Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it, just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees and the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they kept quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, 
but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Jesus at the temple. When Jesus, when Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is, written, it is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him, yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. This is the word of the Lord. Well, today, as you know, is Palm Sunday, and Pastor Fred just read to us the account of Jesus riding into the city, being welcomed as a king. So traditionally, as we begin what is called Holy Week, we begin by exalting Jesus as the king. And in doing so, I want us to evaluate our own lives and seek to answer these two questions, both today and in the week ahead. First of all, what does Jesus as king mean to you? And secondly, how has he changed your life? Now, you may be able to answer these questions easily, or it may be something that you want to ponder and think about during the course of the week. 
as you think about the answers to these two questions, I want us to reflect just for a moment on Luke 19 uh, for just a few minutes and and, uh, just reflect on what it has to say to us. So first, let's look at Jesus the King. In verse 38, it says in our text, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, it's very evident that Jesus was not seen as a king by all of the people, as we see in verse 39, when the Pharisees told Jesus to tell his disciples not to call him the king and not to worship him. And of course, Jesus responded by saying, verse 40, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. We exalt Jesus as king, but what does that mean? What does it mean to be a king? Well, in the dictionary, it states that a king is a male monarch, a magnet, uh, the chief person of its kind or class. Now, history has had many kings, some good and some pretty bad. A bad king was usually in it for what he could get out of it. He was, in essence, uh, corrupted by the power. But good kings had some very distinguishing qualities to add to our dictionary definition. A good king was seen as a protector, a keeper, a defender, as the judge. A good king was completely and wholly devoted to his people. He existed for his people. Now, have you ever gone to see... uh, our queen or the queen when she has been in an area where you've been in the province or maybe if you've had opportunity to travel in England. But I can recall when the queen came to Brantford where I lived uh, back in the mid 80s. And it it was a pretty major event. Thousands upon thousands of people lined the route that she would travel. And yet when she came, it was not a slow procession. She was whisked by in a luxurious limo going from one stop to the next. But even at that, it didn't dampen the crowd at all. The people were thrilled that they got a one or two second glimpse of royalty. I worked in a photographic shop at the time, and we were flooded with roll after roll after roll of film with pictures of the queen. Everywhere that royalty goes, they go first class, and they are pampered and treated with the highest respect. They are among the most wealthy in the world, adorned with elegant wardrobes and jewels while residing in a palace. Yet as we step back some 2,000 years ago on this day, we find a king that was very different. He wasn't wearing fine garments, but dressed in plain clothes. He wasn't coming into town with all the splendor and show that other kings would arrive in. Jesus came to town riding on a donkey with a ragtag group of followers shouting, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Verse 38. This king did not come in power, but in peace and love. He wasn't coming to destroy, which the people had hoped. Instead, he came to save. He fits most of the criteria of a king. He is a monarch. He's a protector. He's a keeper. He's a defender. He's a judge and completely and wholly devoted to his people. But there's one key difference. Other kings have come and gone. But Jesus Christ is still on the throne today. Palm Sunday is a day to reflect on the King of Kings who sits on the throne. We may think at times that the the world around us is uh, collapsing, but God is reigning on high. He's in control. He is the King of those who ask him. Now take a moment to reflect on what Jesus as king means to you. For me, I see a king who is the savior of my soul, who cares enough to watch over me. He loves me enough to challenge me. He convicts me when I stray. He offers forgiveness when I repent. He protects me when I'm down. He defends me when I'm weak. He is a king who loves me unconditionally. 
and I'm sure we can add much, much more to this list. My question is, have you allowed Jesus to be your king? Does he reign on high in your life? If not, Jesus longs to gather you in as a hen gathers her chicks, Luke 13, 34. I encourage you, yield yourself to the king and give him the control. Surrender your life to him and he will not let you down. Jesus is the king who has been appointed to judge all of us. And if you're under his lordship, if you asked him to be your savior, you are part of his kingdom, which will reign throughout all of eternity. Next, I want us to look at the fact in this story was that Jesus wept. Verse 41 says, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. Why did he weep? Well, here was the city that was supposed to be the home of God. It was the location of the temple where it was understood that God dwelled. When he came home, he was rejected. He wept because he knew about the destruction that was lying just ahead. He also knew that the city was filled with corruption. Bruce Larson uh, uh, told about his experience as he walked the road that Jesus had taken so long ago and as he stood in the very place where Jesus stood and wept over the city. And he writes this. He says, some years ago, I took the exact walk with my friend Lloyd Olgavy. We were leading a tour of pilgrims and one day we broke away from the group and took a taxi to Bethany, the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. We visited the tomb where Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. Then we started our walk following the steps of our Lord until we came to the top of the Mount of Olives where Jesus looked over the valley and wept. Along the way, a few miles back, some little boys had joined us. We were delighted and thought there ought to be some children in the recreation of that earlier parade. And just as we were standing there in awe, one little boy tugged on my coat. And he said, Mr., would you like to have my sister? She lives right over there. We were aware of how little had changed all of a sudden in 2,000 years. In this place where God established a beachhead of love, people are still being bartered and degraded. And we continued on our way with a new understanding of why Jesus might have wept. Jerusalem is symbolic of Kingston, Amherstview, Odessa, Sydenham, Harrowsmith, and all of the hometowns and cities uh, around us. Jesus weeps for all of our neighbors. He longs to see them come to him so that they can so that he can release them from the darkness and the burden of their sin. And it's through us that Jesus can come to them to heal the deep loneliness and the emptiness that they feel. Let's move in a little bit closer though into this church, into our homes, most importantly into our lives. I don't know about you, but I'm far from perfect. These are still areas, there are still areas in my life that, that I need to continue to work on. Some of them I'm probably not even aware of. Yet we have a king who is wholly devoted to you and to I. He also weeps when he sees us hurting in the depths of our own sin, holding on to things that he wants us to let go of. He longs for us to come to him because he has the power to overcome and he wants to cleanse us from all of our sin. And this moves us right in to our third point, which is Jesus, the cleansing teacher. Jesus is the master teacher as well as the master cleaner. Sounds confusing, right? Well, let me clarify. In verses 45 to 48, we see that Jesus, when he entered the city, he went straight to the temple. And what did he do? Well, he cleared it out. 
He cleaned it of all the corruptness that flourished, and then he began to teach. It would almost appear as if Jesus could not work in the temple while it was still full of corruption. But once the temple was cleared of the sin and the corruptness that flourished, Jesus could then teach. So what does this have to do with you and I? I think the message is, is very, a very profound one. Listen to the following passages of Scripture. 1 Corinthians 3.16, Do you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? 1 Corinthians 6.19, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? And then 2 Corinthians 6.16, For we are the temple of the living God. So the Scriptures indicate that we are God's temple today. Does this mean that we need to be cleansed before we can be taught? Well, I would say yes. At least my experience has been that teaching comes after I step out in faith, not often or not usually before. The initial cleansing takes place when we take that step of faith to trust Jesus as our Lord and Savior. But as we all know, this is only the beginning. The Holy Spirit then enters into our lives and he begins to show us areas in our lives that we need to allow him to work on. Once again, we step out in faith and say, Lord, help me to clean this uh, part of my life. And he is faithful and he does so. Sometimes the process is long and hard and it can be painful, but when you've come through it, you find that you are somehow stronger. You've grown in your journey with the Lord. And he has taught you more about himself, and he has, in the process, molded you more and more into his image. Jesus comes to us, and he challenges us to give him all areas of our lives. He is patient, yes, but he can also be pretty persistent. You see, Jesus wants to lead you and I in his ways. He wants to give to us his wisdom and his knowledge, but he can only do, or he can only go so far before he comes to another mess in our lives that needs to be cleaned up. When he sees it, he rolls up his sleeves, he gets to work, and if we will allow him to, Once that has been looked after, he reveals to us some more of himself. And the process begins all over again. And through it all, we grow, we learn, and we become more like our Savior in all that we do. So, is Christ the King of your heart today? Is there something in your life that is keeping him off of the throne? Is he showing you something in your life that you need to surrender to him? There's no better time than now to give it to him, whether it's your life or an area of your life or a complete and total total surrender saying, uh, here I am, Lord, I give it all to you. So where are you at? Are you at a turning point? You've tried to live life your way, but you're realizing that you just can't do it anymore? You keep ending up in the same pit, immersed in the same sin. Today's a day to surrender. Today is the day to say, Lord Jesus, I need your help. I need you to come into my life and to take control. Or you've already given your life to Jesus, but you continue to struggle with the flesh, with sin in your life. You you feel like you're coasting in your walk with Jesus, and you you know that there's so much more that he desires to do. So I encourage you to ask Jesus to help you go deeper in your walk with him. Ask him to help you overcome any known sins, and also to reveal sins that you may not even be aware of at this point. And as you do this, you will grow in holiness you will become a clear reflection of Jesus to the world around you. And here's what I really want you to know. God has a great plan 
for each of you. He desires to work in your life in ways that give you purpose and meaning. And my encouragement is to open the door of your heart to the King of Kings. And I promise you, it will be the best decision you've ever made in your life. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for your perfect plan. We thank you that as we celebrate and worship you as King, King of our hearts, King of our lives, Lord, I pray today for those who may be uh, uh, watching or listening to this service who, who, as we've worked through this passage of Scripture, as we've looked at Jesus as King, that maybe have realized that that they have not allowed you to be king. They have not accepted you into their lives. They've not surrendered themselves to your lordship. And so I pray today for anybody that may be watching this. I pray that uh, just as you are there, uh, wherever you are, be it in your living room or at your desk or wherever, just to say, Lord Jesus, I need your help. I surrender my life to you. Come in to my life and help me journey forward. Help me journey in holiness and forgive me of all my sin. And Lord, others may be watching who have surrendered their lives to Jesus, but have got maybe into a rut. We all get there at times. And, uh, and we just... They just realize, Lord, as they're listening, and you've been speaking to them to encourage them that you have so much more for us to experience and journey with you. Again, we can just pray and say, Lord Jesus, uh, we want more of you. We want to surrender more of ourselves. We want you to go into every nook and cranny in our lives and, and clean it out so that we may do what you have planned for us to do, that we may be a reflection to our community, to our neighbors, to our world, uh, a reflection of your love for them. So on this Palm Sunday, we worship you as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we thank you for all that you have done for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And as we go today and as we journey uh, through this week, uh, Holy Week, uh, I encourage you, spend some time in the Scripture. Spend some time reading uh, the passages of Scripture in the Gospels uh, that where we see him coming today, uh, on a donkey, riding into Jerusalem, and then what takes place over what is known as Holy Week, journeying towards uh, the cross and, uh, and his death on the cross, putting all of our sin on himself and uh, paying the price that we deserve. And then as we gather again, uh, be it through video, be it through whatever means we have that... Uh, uh, that we would celebrate the ultimate victory, the rising of your son, Jesus Christ. So go with this benediction today. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Have a wonderful week.